The content of this episode may not be suitable for some audiences. Listener's discretion is advised. Welcome to the Place of Rest, where our aim is to give you language that helps you displace the growing confusion, chaos, and disease of our times. My name is Jonathan Boyce, and it's my pleasure to bring to you today's episode. As Patrick Durkin continues his story, he and Virginia discuss how love and reconciliation redeem our pilgrimage. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Hey, tell us the story behind the story. I just don't want to neglect the fact that there's a big story behind the story, and I don't want to neglect the fact that no matter where people are, what they're experiencing, what they're suffering, right? With right. people, their spheres of influence, that we must not give up nor judge each other in our places of brokenness. We need to understand that something's really broken and systemically broken in the nation we find ourselves in. And this problem we're having with now our families expanding by 10, 11, 12 million people yeah. that are coming into our home. And this situation, this problem that you're describing is feeding a system that when you think about it is financing itself. Yes and generating an economy. It's generating an economy. And somehow it's not going to self-destruct. No. We need to, it, it will cease to be when we rise up and become, displace our own ignorance about the inner workings of these institutions. And when we take responsibility for ourselves and say, wait, something's really wrong. We've got to press into the system, the corruption of the system. So one of you, two of you, three of you, but one of you can set you, Cherry, can bring this thing down. But you know, like I, I want to say this on this podcast in particular is that my story is very extreme. And some people can detach the reality of this from their own life. But in reality, on my mother's birth. I'll just, I'll share this. And I've never shared this on an interview ever anywhere else. I, I've done hundreds of interviews. When I was a child, my mom was suffering from mental illness and she beat me a lot. And it really affected me. And I drank over that woman and used her as an excuse to do drugs and alcohol for 25 years. And in reality, the solution to all of this stuff is love and reconciliation. I was a heartbroken child who didn't think his mom loved him. And I went down the road to hell and it ended up being paved in ice. And my story has a lot of supernatural aspects, supernatural healings. There's God, there's the devil, there's all these things. But in the end, right? And we could do a whole nother show just on the relationship between the what happened to me as a kid and, and the addiction part, honestly. But- I'd like that, I'd like that. Yeah, and, and then at the end of the day, God allows my mother, to be the one who comes in to rescue me. She was literally my only confidant. In While I was in the institution, I could use the phone all day. And it was free. And I could talk. We talked for hours. We mended a 25-year turbulent relationship. She would sit there and cry. She's, I know she was blaming herself. And I was like, Bob, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. And she would hear the people screaming in the background. And, you know, and, and, and she was like with me walking with me every step of the way. And I never, I never understood her kindness. And I, at the end of the show, I'll reveal why. And it's absolutely from the Lord. Okay. So I, I'm going through and they're all pounding on the windows one morning. If I raise my voice, I get a six month extension for another safety evaluation. So I can't get out of pocket in any way. There's 46 B who's awaiting trial. There's 46 C who's beaten a case on insanity. So there's very few of us. I'm being watched under a microscope. Now I'm off the pills. 
They're monitoring me extra. They have people with clipboards following me around. So I, I'm going, they're beating on the windows. It was around breakfast time. And I actually rose my voice and I started screaming at patients. And this is the, really a turning point. This lady came up to me and she said, that's it. I'm medicating you. And I sat down and I was like, oh no, what did I just do? Now I'm trying to get out of this place. I'm being as good as I can. I just had a moment of weakness where I, I screamed at them. And I said, can you people please like whatever? And I was, I was screaming. So it was really wearing me down mentally, the lack of sleep. The medication made me feel like I was under chemotherapy. That's how bad it was. I would throw up a lot in the bathroom. Yeah, it was, it was just impotency from, I mean, so many side effects. Feeling like I'm in a fog, a zombie trance almost all day until they took me off. And when they took me off, it took me about a month to start feeling normal. Okay. So when this all happens, she, she goes and she goes, and if you won't take the pills, I'm going to give you the needle. She walks away. She was going to go get the drugs. And when she came back, I don't know if God touched her heart. That's what I believe. But she looked at me and she said, Mr. Durkin, I'm going to give you one opportunity to calm down because I know that you're, you're not like other patients in here. And she said, if you calm down, I, I will leave this out of your chart. And I said, okay. And then she was walking away. She turned around. It was like a movie. And she said, if you don't like things the way they are in here, write a letter to the White House and I will take it up there personally. Now, the White House is where all the top brass of the administration is. That was code for, I know this is not okay. They, they all felt bad for me. They all knew that it was a mistake that I was there. They all knew that I was like pretty much completely normal besides being a drug oh. addict. That, and I'll add this, having worked with healthcare professionals in mm -hmm. those institutions, she just about lost her shiz too. She's trying to not lose her mind. If you don't take this, I'm going to give you an injection. And thank God she walked away for a minute, cooled her jets and came back and said, what am I doing? I'm becoming a monster. Yeah, she was like an angel. And then what happened next was I wrote a four page letter in five minutes. And I explained to them, I said, my name is Patrick Dirk and I used to be in the business world. I'm well-spoken. I'm high functioning. I said, I have a cell phone. You can check my chart. I'm not on any medication of any kind. And I said, I have names, dates, times, and full journals, booklets of all the incidents. And I named some of the incidents like a man almost killed a woman. He almost beat her to death under a tree at San Antonio State Hospital. She was in a wheelchair for about a month after. He was kicking her right in the face. No one could touch her. No one, could, no one could touch him or intervene. He just put his hands up and he was allowed to walk around the unit for 45 minutes before anything was done. We can't touch him because the, 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 uh, the people who work there will lose their jobs and be prosecuted if they put their hands on a patient who stopped attacking someone. So I write this letter and I folded it That's up. That's crazy. So the people in charge yeah. cannot intervene. No, they're scared of losing their jobs. The behavioral yeah. health techs at San Antonio State Hospital at the time were getting paid $11.50 an hour. They were traumatized human beings, hearing the craziest talk that you've ever heard. It's like being on acid times 10, hearing the craziest thing you've ever heard. And these people work there, they're living there with me. So as traumatized as I am, they are just as traumatized and they have to be there for work. And they're being sexually assaulted By the too. Way yeah, and by the way, there's no way they're not self-medicating. They're not medicating too. There's no I way. Know. I know. It's it's a wild environment. I felt as bad for them as they felt for me. I actually made friends with a lot of them. They were my only sane conversations. They were angels, some of these people. I know. The conversation on what we're doing about mental health has to expand beyond the conventional. Absolutely. I mean... She, she took this letter up to the White House, Virginia, and unbeknownst to me, they, they were so alarmed by me. I mean, they, I was like a diabolical villain to these people at this point. They, they had a secret meeting. There's one doctor at San Antonio State Hospital, they call it Sash. He has so much power that he can free any patient at the stroke of his pen with no questions asked. He just writes an order and you walk out the door. Simple as that. And they read this and, and all the alarms and bells went off and they had a secret meeting. Then they moved me to the Fannin unit, which was an all male unit, mostly full of murderers and pedophiles. That's who they put there. 
patients that were too dangerous because this is a co-ed setting, by the way. There's men and women. Like I've seen a man stumble. He was like absolutely demonic and he stumbled in to the woman's bathroom and assaulted a female patient. Nothing was done. Nothing was done. Police reports are taken. Nothing ever comes of not one of these crimes. So they moved me and everywhere that they would move me, there was a big event that were to happen. I think I ended up writing about 12 letters in all. And I was trying to, I, I took on an evil corrupt system. I became a champion for the people. I became a voice for the voiceless. And I started a real full on war with the, the state hospital system in the state of Texas. Now this is insane. After your letter? This is after the first letter. They okay. start moving me around. So when you said, so they started moving you around because they found out about the letter you sent out. Yes. So, well, I sent it to their administration within the hospital. And I told them what I have. I have contact to the outside world and this is what I'm seeing in here. Now, the reality of this evil situation is, is that San Antonio State Hospital, I researched this on my phone inside. They were about to build a $328 million addition huh? to yeah. the, on the same grounds. And they didn't want any bad press because all the money comes from the San Antonio Police Department, University of Texas, all these huge entities, public funding. So they didn't want any bad stories coming out of there. So they thought they'd move me. Believe it or not, the Fannin unit where the pedophiles were was a lot more quiet, a lot less violence, believe it or not. So they wanted me to, they, they didn't want me to see things. So they put me in a quieter place. Every place that they moved me, something incredible would pop up. That's why I say God was on my side. And he would call me through a door and it'd be so scary because I have to tell you this. On a 46 seat, I was tried for an aggravated robbery. I could have been held for up to 99 years, the rest of my natural life. If I had kept having infractions or if they got so mad, they wanted to frame me. They could have kept me there the rest of my life. Because you have to stay there for the max penalty of your crime until you're deemed safe. So now I'm off all medication. I'm seeing all the neglect, the people urinating on themselves. I saved a 26-year-old man's foot. I actually took all the care package stuff that my mom would send me, like chocolates and sodas, and it's currency in there. So uh, a guy would have... A guy would get molested in the bathroom by an HIV positive patient. They would cover it up and they would not want to, to do the paperwork. They didn't want adult protective services to get involved. So I would go up to the victim and I did this and I bribed him. I said, I'll give you four bags of M&Ms, two bags of chips and a soda. If you give me your sister's phone number and he would give it to me. And I called the sister and I'd say, you're not going to believe this. I'm in here and I'm not crazy, but you have to trust what I'm telling you. And I said, this, this, and this happened to your brother and they're covering it up and I need you to call this person and they have it on record so they have to tell you the truth. And all of a sudden, adult protective services would swarm the unit. The, there was one patient, they didn't want to change the dressing on his foot. He was 26 years old. He had a red line running up his foot and I'm standing there giving a sermon to the staff saying, this is, this is unethical. This young man's going to lose his leg. And what I did was I ended up bribing him got his dad's phone number. And, and then his dad had some money. He was like a 1% biker or something. And he called up, they got a lawyer. All of a sudden the kids' dressings are getting changed. Things were changing within the hospital. Like we were making headway. But I was scared at the same time because they could have kept me the rest of my life. The final straw, Virginia, was one day, my roommate had just threatened to kill his family. And he was like getting drugs smuggled into the unit, everything. And, and they covered all of this up. He, he made a verbal threat. Staff heard it. He, he was going to kill his, his wife and child. He was, I was underneath the tree at Sash in the Fannin unit. And he came out and said, hey, man, I'm going to go get this 20 grand. People are so crazy in there. You just fluff off everything they say. You have to to stay sane, right? He got two mentally challenged patients. And they formed a human ladder and he hopped over the wall and walked off the property. They reported it to the police, but they did not report it to the state, to the local media. He walked through an apartment complex that's behind Sash through a playground where the kids play. It. And he was missing a violent criminal. He was there on five violent felonies, just threatened to kill his, his, his wife and child. And they didn't even notify the victim. She was calling the unit 
while he was on escape and nobody, not even the police told her that her, her attacker basically, because he's got DVs on the same victim, you know, there's a building campaign pending. Ex they wanted to cover this up. They couldn't have it in the media. The, the Holy Spirit came upon me and said, message Ken's five San Antonio. They're the local TV station. And I'm sitting there. The whistles went off. The guy's missing. Two, three hours go by. There's nothing on the news. So I message them. And they, they, whoever's on the other end says, you can't have a cell phone in the state hospital. So I got some quick thinking, like guidance from God. I dropped a GPS pin from inside the unit. Immediately, they messaged back and they said, what is this guy's name? We have to verify the story, yada, yada, yada. So I, I give him the name. All of a sudden, uh, the 10 o'clock news comes on and they run this big expose. It was like a, it was like an alert that this guy's missing. The next morning, they run this huge hatchet piece on the hospital saying how many times the police are up there. There was nine escapes the previous year. The community never knew about it. The gates were never locked when I was there until I, I notified the media about this. So this is on YouTube. If our listeners look up San Antonio, like the city, state hospital escape, look for the one that has like almost 4,000 views, the news story. That's me breaking this story from inside the institution on my cell phone. And on Monday morning, my social worker came down and she had a stack of files. And she said, Mr. Durkin, my job is to get you out of here today. Okay? Oh. The red tape, everything's getting cut through. See, on, on this finding, not guilty by reason of insanity, I should have had seen a psychiatrist once a month, a social worker once a week, and be drug tested for the rest of my natural life on a felony one, felony one charge, right? My, my lawyer, I got the number two pay attorney as my public defender in a, in a, in a lottery, and, and I beat the case on insanity, and then his final miracle to me was they, the doctors wrote this order for that, what we just talked about. And he went before the judge and they were like best friends. And he said, I'm not going for this. She said, take the weekend. My bags were packed waiting to go home at the door. And all of a sudden they're like, you're not going home. Something happened in court. I was terrified. And my lawyer's like, you just got to trust me on this. He's like, just sit tight. You got to trust me on this. And on Monday morning, I went to court and they signed it into law. He wrote his own order that she approved where all I had to do was some outpatient drug treatment. And I was released onto the streets of Corpus Christi homeless, which they never do this. I had no housing. I had a duffel bag full of dirty mental institution clothes. And my lawyer looked at me and he said, all you have to do is go up into that building and sign up for the program. You don't even have to finish it. It's like the crime never happened. I was homeless and clean on the streets of Corpus Christi, Texas. That was on December 16th, 2019. On January 1st, I started writing uh, Fire and Ice, the Meth Bible in a trap house motel room that I was blessed with. And I wrote one of the best books about crystal methamphetamine substance abuse ever. God guided me through it. And I told the world exactly what meth addiction looks like, about how it destroys lives. It's a 716 page book and I wrote it in six months to the day. And after I wrapped the book, I came to Washington state from Texas with almost nothing. And I got a job in the apartment leasing industry and I'm a five-time corporate award winner. I was recognized as a state level leasing consultant of the year, top three finalist. I have 50,000 followers on social media. The book has been read in nine countries by thousands of people. I've watched people get clean through our ministry, mothers and children and fathers returned and families restored. We are the leaders of a movement. Yes, you are. Yes, we are. The enduring voice of our generation will speak to the triumph of the human spirit. Yes. There is so much in this. Would you come back? Absolutely. We're, this is only us scratching the surface. This is a very abridged version of it. But you know what? We're advocates for mental health. We're advocates for uh, substance abuse disorder and child abuse and neglect. And really what we're mission, our mission is to heal the hearts of the brokenhearted any way we can. That's right. The, the mind is in the center cavity of our chest. Yes. Our brain 
is in our head. A beautiful thing, an infinite system, by the way, that yes. will not be ultimately manipulated and controlled by anybody because the primary sphere of government is your soul, your mind, your heart, your will, your conscience, your yes, feelings. That is the, that is. So when we talk, when you hear the word mental health, I want us to begin to echo, you mean a broken heart and a shattered soul. Yes. And that is the state of our nation, a broken heart and a shattered soul. And that is the state of the mental health crisis that they're trying to medicate. You can't medicate that. Exhibit A, Patrick Durkin. The, the, the thing that healed my heart out of this whole journey through hell was after I got out, I was doing a real estate deal after my mother passed away. And I stayed sober after she passed away, which I always thought I would crumble. And, and what happened was I talked to my mom's 80-year-old friend in Myrtle Beach, who I hadn't seen since I was a kid. I found her in the white pages. And we were talking about my mom's condo and she directed me to this guy who bought it on the courthouse steps. And I reobtained my mom's property. She just owed some back taxes on it and I paid it. But in, the, in that phone call, the lady said, do you know why your mom was so nice to you while you were in the, the institution? And I said, why? And she said, because when she was 19, she had a suicide attempt and she lived in one of those places for a year of her life. And on my mother's birthday, and I haven't cried in a long time, and you got me close. I just want to honor her for what she did for me. And my mother's love and prayers for what really saved my life. And as bad as my book is, because it goes into detail, she told me, she said, Patrick, finish that book because everybody says they're going to do it. And nobody does. And I did. And now it's being read all over the planet. Well, we honor your mother with you, Patrick. Yes, Give us her full name. Kathleen Ann Durkin. Kathleen Ann Durkin. Thank you for Patrick. And I want to speak to every Kathleen out there, to every mom out there, yeah. that this is not our darkest moment. This is our finest hour. And we have the resources, the capacity, and the willpower as mothers and fathers, too, in a different way, mm -hmm. to rise up and say, not on our watch. Not on our watch. Patrick, thank you. Virginia, thank you. It was an honor to come on here, and I can't wait to work with you again in the future. We're changing the world. Yeah, we are. And you know what? We're going to have you back to tell the story about your sweet mom. Absolutely. I'll come back on anytime. Thank you for having Thank you. me. God bless you, Patrick. God bless you. Bye. We hope listening to this episode has brought you closer to experiencing the freedom of wholeness and healing. If you have questions or comments about today's episode or for updates about rest, please visit our Instagram or Facebook at The Place of Rest. If you would like more information about Virginia or to support and join the cause of rest, please go to theplaceofrest.com forward slash donate or call 949-289-5935. Thank you for listening to Rest with Virginia Dixon. We'll see you next week.